So in terms of you know, how this applies to us, I, mean, I think it, you know, we ourselves as, a, as individuals, as a spiritual community, are trying to go through this path ourselves. And so quite often in the past, you know, we refer to ourselves as going through the wilderness course and wanting to settle down. And, and so, you know, I mean, some of the things I'm saying here, I'm talking about, I'm not really talking about the Hebrews. I'm really not talking about the Israelites. I'm really not talking about the Jewish people. I'm talking about us. That makes sense? There's a subtext of what I'm saying. Sometimes people need it explained, well, actually. But I prefer just to talk about the Hebrews and the Jews and the Israelites as a way of talking about us as a spiritual community and the sort of things and challenges that we are going through, the sort of things that we need to change ourselves if we're going to enter Canaan, if we're going to enter Chungaguk. What is it that we need to do within ourselves to change? individually, as families, as a spiritual community. So we're not slaves or servants anymore, but actually we are owners of Chungoguk. So we say this pledge as the owner of Chungoguk. We say it, but how much do we actually mean it? How much are we actually living like that? How much are we actually still really servants of Chungoguk? Yeah? How much are we just still stuck in the old slave mentality? How much are we just thinking, well, what's the most important thing? I should just obey. You know what I mean? I Peter? That leads to misunderstanding of absolute obedience. Uh huh. Just that simple comment. Do you want me to, uh, to do a riff on that then? <coughs> no, it's just. <laughs> if we hear we have to be absolutely obedient. Slave mentality that means you just have to do exactly what you're told. Yes. But that's not what God actually means. No. Do you know the word obey and obedience do not actually exist in the Bible? There's no word for obey or obedience. There's no word in Hebrew which means do as you're told. There's no word in Hebrew that means obey in the way we understand the word obey. Is that surprising? Shocking. <laughs> So it's impossible for Jews to be disobedient because they don't even think using that language. The concept of obeying God doesn't exist within the Hebrew Bible. Why not? Because the law applied to each one. So what is God interested in? Was God interested in obedient children? Responsibility. Yeah, so it's a movement from obedience to responsibility. So what do slaves do? Slaves are very... A good slave is what? A good slave is very obedient. He does as he's told. No more, no less. Yeah? Anne? What I understood about obedience, absolute obedience, uh -huh. is uh, related to filial piety. If uh -huh. we understand the father's will and uh -huh. the father's heart, then we... Uh, want to achieve our Father's will with love. This is what I, I understand mm -hmm. by absolute obedience. Mm. So it's not just obey because I should, or you know, some mm. law, but because I really want to love my Father mm -hmm. and fulfill his expectation on the world, yeah. and on, right. and on me mm -hmm. particularly. Mm. Okay, it's very interesting. I mean, if you, if you read, the, if you read the, the Bible in English, sometimes you find the word obey. So, but the Hebrew word doesn't exist. So somebody's translated from the Hebrew into English and they put the word obey. So if you go back to the Hebrew word, it just means listen to, understand, hearken to. So the greatest of the Jewish prayers is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Hear, listen. And the great commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and strength. Love your Lord your God. Yeah, so as one is listen and the other is to love with all your heart. That's the core of the Old Testament tradition is about love, of, love for God. Everything is motivated out of heart and love for God. And so if we unpack where does obedient business come from, if you look at the English word, it comes back, um, you know, obey, look, go back to the Latins, is obedir, which means dir, D-I-R-E in Latin means what? Anybody study Latin here? To speak. Yeah, so to, 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 to listen. Dear. Yes. Speak and listen, it's about that. And ob means to, so it's listen to. So that's why if you look in the dictionary, do as you're told, it's connected to listening. 
Okay. Well, then it became corrupted in about the 14th century because it got mixed up with a word means a base. So in French, obéissance and abasir. Well, French is terrible. Abaisance, thank you. <laughs> so these two words, abaisance means to abase, means to bow down and humble yourself, except all like that. Uh, but obedience is to do with listening. So these two words in the, in the Middle Ages became confused. Yeah? And so people thought to obey means just to abase yourself. These two words in English became confused. And so then obedience then became to abase yourself to somebody. Um, whereas the original meaning just means to listen. And the Hebrew to, means to listen, to understand, and to act based upon understanding. So it means that you should act following your conscience. So conscience, again, you look at the meaning of that, is made of two words. Con means with, and science, with knowledge. Act based on knowledge, act based out of understanding. So what should our understanding be based on? The truth. Where do we discover the truth? By studying God's word. So the God's, by studying God's word, this forms our conscience. So when we act, we act based upon out of understanding. So what we're listening to, that's why we have the expression, listen to your conscience. Yeah? So when we talk about absolute obedience, if you go to what does the word obey mean, well, we go back to the original meaning, going back to the Hebrew, it means listen. So we should listen to our conscience. That's what it means. So absolute obedience is not to any human being. It's just to absolutely listen to and follow your conscience. Never go against your conscience. Never do something that you know is wrong. Because that's what God wants. God wants people who are living according to their conscience so they don't need a government. They don't need a leader or anybody to tell them what to do because they know what to do because what to do is just, they just need to follow their conscience, live according to their conscience. And that's the kind of society that God wants to create, that kind of realm. But of course, you know, in our spiritual community as well, some people take the expression absolute obedience and they twist it for their own particular purposes. John. Yeah, I think in 1983, Father said that the leader-centered movement was over. We, we follow leaders in the wilderness, mm -hmm. but we now relate as families. Yeah. You know? And... Um, also, like people in the able position, it's not the position or the title, it's how are their lives that the, the person, Father's words are the person sacrificing, you know, doing the most. That kind of person should be in the central position. Mm -hmm. And uh, what Hunjin has done now in America is completely opened it all out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it should be. And also, Father said, actually, we should, our main purpose is fulfilling home church, which I don't hear mentioned at all these days. Mm -hmm. That's, even Father said, mm -hmm. that is our destiny. Mm -hmm. Everything else is incidental. So, like you say, William, it's our conscience. And um, uh, as I say, in America, Hunsian has opened it right out. And I think it should be done on every continent, that the leaders, uh, we, elect our, we should elect our leaders. Mm -hmm. And um, the members should be consulted in all the decision-making processes. I think that's, it should be straight and fundamental that yeah, we do I that. Yes, I mean, if you own something, then you should be consulted about the decisions that are made and be involved in the decision-making process, yes. Yeah, so Father started Home Church um, the end of the, basically around about the end of the children's course, which was for 21 years. So the end of the children's course in 1981 was a 21-year course, by which time we're supposed to become adults and grown up and just go out and to become messiahs ourselves in a home church. Yeah, so... Can I just qualify that, please, William? Yes. I don't mean... I think we can still have a church system. It's still useful mm -hmm. because maybe members mm. need a boost. You know, maybe not everyone's confident to mm. go and actually go and do, you know, whatever it is uh -huh. that uh, we, we could do if we, mm. if we had more confidence. So mm. I'm not saying that uh, we shouldn't have a church system. I'm mm. saying there shouldn't be like one person at the top of a pyramid making sure. all the decisions yeah. and everybody just does what they said. I think that's totally undemocratic and yeah. unprincipled. Oh, I agree with you, yeah. <laughs> it's very unprincipled, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we've allowed ourselves to remain in Egypt. We have. We have. Yes. It's true. It's true. And that's the problem. How can you go into Chung or Guk if you still have the mindset of a slave living in Egypt, waiting to be told what to do and thinking that you have to just do what you're told? Yeah. That's the subtext. <laughs> well, if you want to make it explicit, thank you. <laughs> now everybody knows what I'm talking about. So what's a change of lineage then? Well, it's basically, it's a change of identity. So for the Hebrews, changing their identities, st instead of thinking of themselves as the slaves, 
of the Pharaoh to think in themselves, we are the sons and daughters of God. We are the people of God. And changing from Satan's way of life to God's way of life. And so, just skip through this, what's Satan's way of life? We have a false sense of identity. And so, thinking and feeling, I'm God's son, I'm God's daughter, and the depth of my being, in every cell of my body, I know and I feel that's who I am, the son or daughter of God. Sometimes people find their identity in something else. Manchester United supporter. Yeah? yeah? <laughs> or nationality or something else. People wrap themselves up and find their identity in something other than their relationship with the divine. They've given themselves another sense of identity because they don't really feel in the depths of their being, yes, people often don't have the confidence to say, yes, I'm the son of God, I'm the daughter of God, I am loved by God, I deserve to receive God's love. I, the world that I live in is the world that God created for me. Because people, because of original sin, people don't feel like that then they find their identity in something else, something much more superficial and something false. And then people often think things are the purpose of life, what's important is, you know, getting a Ferrari or whatever. People often use bad language. People often workaholics, work seven days a week or f just want to have fun all the time, don't respect their parents, uh, settle arguments and disputes using violence or murder, are often very promiscuous and steal and lie, and envy. So that's the sort of way of life, Satan's way of life, you could say. And so God wanted to change that. And so the, through the Ten Commandments then, God changed Satan's way of life and Satan's tradition and set the minimum for living a righteous religious life. So the first commandment then is, I am the Lord your God. That's the most important thing to understand. I am the Lord your God. And it means if you understand, if you know who you are, then everything else falls into place. If you know who you are, you'll know how to live. If you know who you are, you know what to do. Yeah? But often people have an identity crisis. They don't know who they are. They don't know what to do. They don't know what this, that, the other. Most important thing to know and to understand is who you are. Where do I come from? What is my identity? What is my lineage? Yes? Where do I come from? If you understand and you feel you know who you are, then everything else falls into place very simply. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me, so God comes first. You shall not make a graven image. Means, you know, all these images, concepts we have about God that are all false. You shan't take the Lord's, you know, the Lord's name in vain. Why do you think that's a, do you think that's important not to take God's name in vain? Hmm? Uh, mean, explain what that really means. What does it mean to take God's name in vain? Yeah, that's right. It's really serious. It's number three. It's, it's a worse crime than murder. <laughs> Why is it, what does it mean? You shall not take your Lord's name in vain. God, you shall not take God's name in vain. Does it just mean you shan't say, oh God, oh Christ, when, you know, something happens? That's a prayer. Yeah. Sorry? What? Violation of order. Violation of order. It's to do with order, yeah. So sometimes it means you shan't, so taking God's name in vain is not about, oh, you mustn't say, oh God, when something wrong happens, because that's just a prayer. You haven't some finished it off. Oh God, please give me strength in this situation. Oh Christ, help me. That's all it is. When people say, oh God, or oh Christ, it's just the memory, the echo of prayers that you, people used to say in those situations. That's not taking God's name in vain. Taking God's name in vain is, is what is called priestcraft. When a, when a person in authority, like a priest, would say, if you don't do what I tell you to do, God is going to punish you. Okay? So what is that doing? So one of the songs we were, we were singing was about God's name, lifting up God's name, wasn't it? Yeah. So when people misuse God's name, it's when they use God's name for their own political purposes. When they use religion for political purposes. When they use God's name and authority to try and manipulate and control people and get them to do what they want them to do. That's, does that make sense? So actually the Bible is a very anti-religious book. Understand what I'm saying? The Bible is a, the Bible is a critique of institutionalized religion. Yeah? Who likes, I don't know, most people who join the Unification Church don't like institutionalized religion originally. Um, <laughs> but became institutionalized. But anyway, 
It's the, the Bible is a, a, a critique of institutionalized religion. It's very much against religion. It's an anti-religious book. But don't you think the unification movement became or started to become de-institutionalized with the advent of blessed couples having families? Or was that yet another institution? No. I mean... I, mean, the... I believe that that was a beginning of the de-institutionalization of what we understood as being institutionalised when we did MFT and all that stuff. Yes, I mean, MFT was very institutionalised, and the church generally was, <clears throat> but then the tradition is supposed to flow through the family. The family is supposed to be the basis of society. All our <clears throat> major ceremonies and rituals are in the family. So, for example, when you have a, when you have a baby, then who holds the eight-day ceremony? Parents. The parents, right? Within the Catholic Church... Who baptizes the child? The priest. So that's where the institution has control over the sacraments. Yes? But within our community, spiritual community, the family is the basis. The parents are the priests. The parents are the priests, and they have the authority to dedicate their children to God. We don't need to go to our church leader to do that. Our church leaders don't have that. What I'm saying is that. Yes. Into the it should have been, yeah. But it didn't happen. Not really, oh. in my opinion. <laughs> yes. There's also, I mean, a spiritual area in our movement, which is the champion providence, which is institutionalized from this point of view. Because, I mean, another question is. You don't, you, don't want to, you don't want to broadcast your question to the world then. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, yes, I mean, champion, again, it's. There's no real sacraments that are given there. I said that the family is supposed to be the basis. The blessed couples have the authority to become parents or true parents eventually. I mean, like the blessings of the ancestors. The oh, liberation, yeah. Yeah, but you're the one that goes along and does it yourself. You're the one that goes through the ceremony and liberates your ancestors. Nobody's doing it for you. You're the one that goes there and participates in that for them and with them. Does that make sense? You're just turning up and doing the bowels and praying and all the things. And then, of course, you know, when you're liberating your ancestors, it also means you need to go through all sorts of inner changes yourself. It's not just that. Okay, so don't take God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath. That's very important. Again, this is something which... Uh, why did God set up the Sabbath? What's the Sabbath? That's the day when people don't go to work. Work is good should work six days or five or six days a week. But the idea of the Sabbath is that nobody works. Why is that? Why did God institute the Sabbath? In order to honour God. No. <laughs> to become godlike. God took a rest. God created the universe in six days. and the seventh day, he rests. So if you want to be like God, you have to take a rest one day a week. Okay. There's more to it than that. What's supposed to be the basis of the kingdom of heaven? Family. Family. Yeah. Right. So what's that then? Family. So in order, in order to do that, you need to have a family. In order to create that, there needs to be a time when the family is together. It's my wife's favorite word as well. <laughs> together. So God said, okay, work six days a week, one day of the week, just spend time together. On this, this day, nobody works. So all the food is prepared the evening before and all the washing up is done after the Sabbath finishes. And that one day, all the, parent, the parents are there, the children are there, nobody goes out to work, everyone's there. They spend time together eating, drinking, having fun together, having, reading together, praying together, playing music, having, just creating this family time. I think it's one disaster was we worked too hard. Unification Church, we... Didn't follow this. Yeah, but yeah? now we've got Angel, and that's every eight days, so we're still working harder because we're working seven days and we're having Angel every eight days. <laughs> the problem with Angel, it's just something you do in the morning. Actually, God said you should take the whole day off as a family and just spend time together. So God wants to dwell in the family. How can God dwell in the family if the family's not together? Is it possible? No. So in order to have God to dwell in the family, God established a structure which meant it possible. God created a space, a, 
in time, God separated this time off, which was his time, where he was going to dwell and live in the family. Yeah? So I think, you know, I think in our unification church, we work too hard, we fundraise too much, we did stuff on a Sunday which we shouldn't have been doing. We should have just taken the day off and spent time together with God. Unfortunately, we didn't establish that tradition. I think it's been a disaster. You know, this is something that God revealed to the Israelites. Who are the Israelites? The people of Israel? Who are the people of Israel? Who? Us. Us. Yeah, we're the, you know, it's not just the first Israel, it's the second, third, and fourth Israel. God said this is something for eternity. God created this space where us, where he could dwell with us and our family. Yeah. You honour your father and mother. This is, again, very radical in the ancient world. The idea should honour your mother. Equal authority within the family. Shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. So all these things, then, as we know. So also, then, was the development of the moral life. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in that land of Egypt. Again, a very shocking thing. So the first thing in the whole of the world where this idea appeared. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. How do people normally feel about foreigners? They don't, don't like them generally. Yeah? I mean, the Greeks, for the Greeks, everybody who wasn't Greek was a barbarian. Was not, yes, that's the reality. Most societies are racist and prejudiced against foreigners and people who are different. But actually, God said to them, you were once like that, you know what it's like, you know how much you suffered, so um, treat them well. So it's the earliest appearance of empathy in the ancient world. And the biblical attitude towards law, again, is very different. This is from the Psalms. I, shall, I rejoice in following your statutes, rejoice in great riches. I shall walk at liberty, for I sort out your precepts or laws. So here, the biblical idea is that law creates, free, it creates freedom. Yeah. Do you know what the word freedom means? As some of you come to my lectures and know this. Freedom's an English word. It doesn't exist in any other language. I know people who speak other languages are going to disagree, but I'll explain why. They're so, just talking about liberty. What? Just talking about yes, so the word freedom is made up of two words, free and dom. Free means liberty. So in French you have liberté. In Germany, a Freiheit. All, that all just means free. So the word dom means law comes from the Anglo-Saxon word doom. So you have doomsday, is judgment day. The book of dooms is the book of laws. So the word freedom is free and law together. You're free within the law. So in other languages, only have the word free, or they have the word law. But only English has the word freedom, free within the law. There's a word created by Alfred the Great. The reason he created it, because he was translating the Bible into English, and he couldn't find an English word for the biblical understanding, and so, like a good German, he took two words and stuck them together and created <laughs> freedom. He was Anglo-Saxon. I mean, people ask me, do you speak another language? I say, yes, I speak, I speak the Anglo-Saxon dialect of German. So there you are. So that's what he did. So that's what the world that God wants to create. So it talks about there's no freedom outside the principle. That's what it is. You, you know, we are free to do, pursue our original mind, free to pursue beauty, truth, and goodness within the law. So these laws that God gave, don't murder, don't steal, that creates a framework. You can do anything you want except kill and steal and murder, these sorts of things. Within that space that is created by the law, you're protected. Yeah? And you can pursue your original mind, follow your conscience, pursue beauty, truth, and goodness, paint the kind of pictures you want to paint. Worship God in the way you want to worship God. Oh, that creates a space, this realm of freedom. Yeah, so that's what it is. And so that's what God is trying to train the people to become free, become responsible, no freedom about responsibility. Again, that's a biblical understanding. So God is moving the people from a slave, living as slaves to living as free people. Yes, but it's not automatic. They had to go through this process. We have to go through that process. And the question is, have we made that? After all these years, individually, as, a, as families, as a spiritual community, have we made that transition yet? So we are able to enter Chongyo Gut in that sense. <clears throat> so, just passing that, so again, the Holiness Code, the whole biblical understanding is everything's wrapped up in uh, the worship of God. 
So let's move on then. So the foundation of time, am I stopping? Um, it's 1 20 minutes. Okay, well, my clock stopped here. Thank you. So what's the time now? 5 to 1. Okay, I'm the wrong time. Okay, so we'll carry on here. So we've got foundation of faith, we know this, foundation of substance, we know that. Okay, so let's have a look. So Moses then was the central person, foundation of faith. The offering then was living and following uh, the commandments, living within the law. And then when they finally went on the little detour, then they finally came to Canaan, and there was a 40-day period for the 12 spies to go out, representing the 12 tribes to spy the land out. And so God was seeing, are they yet ready to enter into Canaan? Have they made the necessary transition? So they went there, it went to the land, said it's flowing with milk and honey, it's really nice. And then Caleb said, let's go up at once and occupy it for we're well able to overcome them. So he felt, we can do it. Yeah, we can do it. You know, they're big and they're this, that and the other, but we can do it. You know, we have the spirit, we've got the morale, God is with us, we can occupy this land. So they had confidence, they had belief, yeah. I said, you know, whether an army wins a, a war or not, whether an army wins a battle or not, is not only partly to do with their equipment. Mostly it's to do with the spirit that they have, isn't it? You know, sometimes you find very small, you know, little groups of soldiers and they accomplish extraordinary things because they believe it. They know they can do it and they work together and they have this self-belief and self-confidence. And it's just another power that they have. Is that? Well, <laughs> either is, you know, I mean, that's quite a difficult parallel to discuss, isn't it? Well, a lot of it's, you mean with us? Yeah. Well, yes, I mean, a lot of it, you know, sometimes we believe we can, sometimes we don't. And most of the time, I don't. <laughs> but, you know, we... Anyway. Anyway, so, but anyway, it's interesting to see. So, some people then, they said, we're not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than us. So they brought, they brought to the people of Israel an evil report. And the people lamented. And they said, let's choose a captain and return to Egypt. But only two spies, Joshua and Caleb, argued against them. So what's going on here? Are the people ready to go into Egypt yet? Sorry, are the people ready to go into Canaan yet? They're not ready, are they? So if, they'd got, if they had gone into Canaan, what would have happened? Would they have been successful or not? It would have been a disaster because they weren't yet ready. They didn't have, they hadn't, you know, they, they spent about 21 months, I think it was, 21 days, became 21 months, but still they hadn't grown and become fully adult. Again, 21 months is a very, very short space of time. How many of us, 21 months after we joined, were in that space? Yeah, maybe we were. <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> and so, in that sense, Satan invaded. They weren't ready to go into Canaan yet. And then something very interesting happens. Moses talks to God about it. God says, how long will this people despise me? I will strike them and disinherit them, and I'll make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. So God then, do you think God is very patient or very impatient? That's right. So God then, he likes Moses, and he says to Moses, look, I'll get rid of this lot, we'll find a better people for you to lead. Yeah, it's a bit like, um, you know, okay, you're a great manager, we'll get rid of all these players and find, buy in some better ones. And Moses said, interesting, and Moses said the Egyptians will hear about it. So what's that about? Moses says to God, look, God, if you do that, then the Egyptians will hear about it. In other words... Think about your reputation. Yeah? So he's challenging God. And then he says to God, the, sl the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity, so pardon iniquity of these people. So, God, so Moses then remind, throws back at God the things that Mo God said to him. He reminds God about what he'd said about himself. Don't you remember? You told me that you were slow to anger. Don't you remember? So, you know, that's why you should pardon these people. And so uh, God does that. So do you think God's happy or unhappy that Moses is arguing with him and standing up to him? Why, why would God be happy? He's got a very hmm? He's got a very effective 
He's very what? Effective central figure. Yeah, but why is God happy that he's arguing with him? Mm, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He really, yeah, exactly. He really cares about the people, and God is happy. He really cares about the people. He really is arguing with God, not because he's disagreeing with God in that sense, but because he really cares about the people. That's why he's willing to stick his neck on the line and stand up for the people and protect the people from God's wrath in that sense. And so God, I think, is very happy. Yes, this is the kind of person I want to lead my people. Someone who's willing to stand up for them, someone who really genuinely cares about them, someone who's willing to risk his life, argue with me to protect the people. And so at one point, you know, even God said to Moses, you know, actually it's part of the, it's not in here, is it? You know, God, Moses actually says to God, look, if you're going to do this, you can strike me out of the book of life as well. If you're going to, if you're going to do this, you can, I don't want anything to do with you. You can strike me out of the book. You can kick me out if you want. I don't care. You know, this is more important to me than you in that sense. Anyway, so the 40 days then become 40 years. And as we know, and then God says, all those over 21 years are to die in the wilderness. So why is it that everybody over 21 years was to die in the wilderness? Yeah. All the people who couldn't remember Egypt, all the people who could remember Egypt, who still had the slave in them, died. Because God didn't want slavery to be taken into Canaan. So he wanted only the people who grew up in the desert, the people who grew up in this different society in which it, things were governed not by a slave driver, but by the law, the rule of law, not the rule of a human being. That's the kind of people he wanted to go into, into Canaan to create that kind of society. So God was changing them individually as a family, as a society, so they were ready to live and go into Canaan. So that's why they didn't. Anyway, some decided to go into Canaan Canaan immediately, and they were defeated. It was a disaster. But then there was also another interesting thing happened. There was a lot of turmoil at this time, very testing time. So one of the, one of the most outstanding leaders of the uh, Hebrews at that time, someone called Korah, so he and 250 chiefs of the congregation, they assembled themselves against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far by you know, saying you can't go into, into Canaan. For all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Hmm? It's really interesting to unpack this. There's one person, Korah, he says, look, Moses, you know better than the rest of us. We're all equally good as you. Why do you put yourself above everybody else? So what do you think about that then? Sorry? Interesting, isn't it? Leadership challenge. Yes, it is. But I mean, how far through the 21 years did that happen? This happened, this happened after the, the incident with the, with the spies. So after the change of course, no, we're not going to go into Canaan now. Now we're going to spend 40 years wandering around in the wilderness. So at this point, then, there was all kinds of confusion took place. Some people said, yes, let's go into Canaan anyway. We don't want to go into the desert. So they invaded Canaan and they were defeated. Then there was a rebellion by Korah who said, you know, why, you know, we're all just as good as you, Moses. So it's very interesting. It was an example of him losing faith in Moses. Well, it's very interesting. I mean, the subtext of this is very interesting. Um, I'll read... Read it out to you. It's a sort of. This is uh, what it says. It, this is a commentary in the from in the Talmud, and it says. And so Korah, basically, this is this is the this is what he's supposed to have said. He said, "In my neighbourhood, there's a widow." And with her were two fatherless daughters, so just one wid a widow living with her two daughters. There's got no men to help out. So the widow had only one field. And when she was about to plough the field, Moses said to her, you shall not plough with an ox and an ass together. So one of the laws to do with uh, taking care of animal welfare is that you shouldn't plough with an ox and an ass together because it isn't good. 
because they're of different strengths. There are lots of laws about animal welfare in the Bible. Anyway, so he said that. You can't plough the way you want to plough. So when she's about to sow the, sow the field, Moses said to her, you shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed. In other words, you can't mix up the seeds and mix up the crop. Again, it's in the Leviticus. So far, you know, things are just becoming more difficult for her because of this religion. Then she is about to reap the harvest and stack the sheaves. And Moses says to her, you shall not harvest the gleanings. These are the leftover bits uh, because they are for the poor. So that was, uh, again, a biblical law that when you did the harvest, you had to leave lots of bits and pieces around for the poor people could come along. Yeah? And then when she's about to bring the remaining harvest to the granary, Moses said to her, give me one-tenth. Okay, so she submitted to God's decree and gave them to him. What did the poor woman do next? She sold the field and bought two sheep. So she might clothe herself and with the wool she could uh, run a little business from the lambs. And as soon as the sheep brought forth their young, Aaron, Moses' brother, came and said to the widow, give me the first males, for that's what the Bible says. All the firstlings should be mine. And again she submitted to God's decree and gave the young sheep to Aaron. And when the time for shearing arrived, she sheared her sheep. Then Aaron came again and said to the widow, give me the first portion of the shearing. Then she said, there's no strength in me to withstand this man. I'll slaughter the sheep and eat them. After she slaughtered them, Aaron came again and said to her, give me the shoulder, the jaws and another part, because I'm the priest. And the widow said, Though I have slaughtered my sheep, I am still not free of your demands. Behold, I devote my sheep to the use of the temple. And Aaron said to her, If the sheep are devoted to the use of the temple, they belong entirely to me, etc., etc. And so here, this is, again, as I said, the Bible is often a very anti-religious book. So here's a whole critique of the religious system of the temple and the offerings and all this sort of things, uh, which it looks like the priests are using this to become very wealthy and very rich themselves. So there's all kinds of subtexts going on in the Bible. And so this is the subtext here of Korah's rebellion, is that Moses and Aaron have set up this whole system of rules, and through it they're profiting and becoming very wealthy. Okay, so you've got all these kind of discussions going on you know, within the Hebrews, which are not all that different to some of the discussions that go on with us. You know, similar kind of things that are going on. You know, all human beings. Anyway, so that was Korah's rebellion. So the third foundation of the tabernacle, so that wasn't laid, and so Satan invaded. And so it started off in the third course, again, foundation of faith, foundation of substance for the 40 years, and there they wandered around. So how did that start? So as you know, they started off from Kadesh. And again, Moses had gone through a tough time, had all these rebellions to deal with, and now the people, now there's no water for the congregation, and they assemble themselves against Moses and Aaron, and the Lord said to Moses, take the rod and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. And so what did, Moses, what did God tell Moses to do? What's he supposed to do to the rock? Like Read the text and tell me what he was supposed to do. <coughs> tell, the tell the rock. Thank wow. you. Speak to the rock, yes? Tell the rock before my, their eyes to yield its water. Tell the rock. Okay. So what happened the first, when they, when, when they came out of Egypt and they didn't have any water, what did God say to Moses? Strike the rock. So the first time when they came out of Egypt, they didn't have water and God says, strike the rock and he struck the rock and water came out. This time, God said to him, tell the rock and the water will come out. Okay, what's the difference between striking and telling? Well, one you use a stick and the other you talk to it. Okay, right, <laughs> it's true. <clears throat> okay, now, <clears throat> now relate it to relate relate it to human beings now. Sorry. The difference between being slaves and falls. Right, so. Okay. 
Okay, so some people you, can, you need to motivate them with a stick or a whip. So who needs to be motivated with a stick? Slaves. Slaves. Okay, now do you motivate free people with a stick? How should you motivate them? With your reason. With words. You inspire them with words and with reason, yes? Okay. Anyway, so what did Moses do? <clears throat> now this is what Moses said. Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring forth water for you out of the rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his rod twice and water came forth. So what do you think about the way Moses spoke to them? Not very nice. He lost his temper. Yeah, he lost his temper. Yeah, there was a group of people that were rebelling, but he accused them all of being rebels. Do you understand? It's a bit like when you're in a classroom and there's one or two children who misbehave and the whole class gets punished. Is that fair? Do children like that kind of teacher? No. No. It's not fair. It's not right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, anyway, so that's what Moses did then. He didn't treat them with respect. He didn't speak to them the way he should have spoken to them. He lost his temper. He became angry with them. And then he struck the rock twice and the water came forth. And then God said, Because you did not believe in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the people, you shall not bring this assembly into the land I've given you. Okay? So because he lost his temper, became angry and started raging against them and accusing them and judging them, he lost his position in front of them. They could no longer respect him in that way. He didn't sanctify God in that sense. So, you know, the principle itself interprets it uh, like this. When Moses struck the rock the first time, he's striking fallen Adam. So what does it mean to strike fallen Adam? And the, I mean, the Divine Principle book has two and a half pages on this, really arcane, you know, little detail. Must be something important there. Right, so it means, you know, sometimes you need to chastise somebody, sometimes you need to correct somebody's mistake, but then it's, you're, you know, like that. But when he struck twice, it's striking the original, he's striking the restored Adam, so it's like hurting someone's heart. Yes, became angry and judged them, accused them and hurt their hearts. It wasn't just correcting the person, which, which should have been done, but actually became angry and then hurt the person. And so we can see this, you know, does this phenomenon ever happen in, in our spiritual community? Yes. Yes? Yeah, very often, you know. You had people like that, you know, who sometimes have been leaders, done this, became angry and lost, lost it, basically, and hurt people. Yeah, so there's a difference between, you know, correcting somebody and uh, doing that. And so because Moses did this, then that became a problem. Yeah, and so, yeah, this is a real issue. Anyway, so Joshua then went on to inherit Moses' position. Moses is a very unusual person because he asked God to find a replacement. Why is that unusual? Normally God chooses the replacement person. Not really. What do, what do leaders usually like to do? Hang on to power. Ever come across a dictator who resigned or retired gracefully? <laughs> no, but Moses is an extraordinary... One of the most extraordinary things about Moses is that God told Moses this. This incident at the rock happened at the beginning of the 40-year course. The beginning of the 40-year course, God said to Moses, because of this, this and this, you won't be able to lead the people and you won't be able to go into Canaan yourself. In other words, you're not going to be rewarded. So what would you expect Moses to do? Lose interest. Lose interest. Resign, retire. Well, if I can't go into Canaan, okay, I'm not going to have anything to do with this anymore. But the fact is, for the next 40 years, despite knowing that he wasn't going to go into Canaan himself, Moses led the people for 40 years, despite knowing... He, was, he wasn't going to be going there himself, despite knowing that he wasn't going to get his bonus or his reward. He still did it. It's extraordinary, isn't it? You know, quality of leadership, you can see there. Uh, yes? Why did God not forgive Moses? It's not that he didn't forgive him. God did forgive him. It's just he couldn't, he was no longer qualified to lead the people into Canaan. He wasn't qualified. So... That's what it means, you see. When he struck the rock with a stick, 
the first time round, that's because that's what they needed. To, they needed a stick to motivate them to get going. But by the time they got to the Canaan, they'd already made a huge amount of progress internally. And so God just wanted Moses to speak to them and inspire them with words. But by hitting them with a stick, it means that Moses hadn't changed. The people had changed, but Moses' leadership style also needed to change. But he hadn't changed his leadership style. Yeah? So as the people grow and develop, so also the leader also needs to grow and develop and to lead in a different way. Yes? So Moses no longer you know, showed he wasn't the leader who was capable of leading people in Canaan. Yeah? Because he was treating them still with a stick. That's why. It wasn't that God didn't forgive him. God forgave him. I'm sure he apologized to God profusely. I'm sure God forgave him, but it just meant he wasn't qualified to go into Canaan. It wasn't that kind of leadership that was necessary anymore. That makes sense? So, you know, it's quite difficult. Sometimes people can be very good leaders in a particular circumstance, but when the situation changes, they're not suitable anymore. They need to step aside. And you need a new type of leader in a new kind of situation. Some people are able to adapt and change and, and grow as the situation grows, they can grow as well. Yeah. yeah, And that's what Moses, you know, in this particular instance, he wasn't able to do that. Which is, but again, you know, if you look at his situation, he just had this and that and the other. You can imagine how frustrated he was. You know, the people hadn't, they weren't able to go into Canaan as he expected. And they had some people going off and some people rebelling and this, that and the other. So basically, Moses needed to take time out. <laughs> really. He should have gone away and counted to 100,000 before he went to, you know, after this conversation with God, you know, the people complaining again, you know. So uh, the act of complaining, what kind of mentality is that? Slave mentality. Slave mentality. Yeah, if you're responsible and you see something that needs to be fixed, what do you do? Fix it. You fix it yourself. You don't think, oh, why doesn't so-and-so do it? Why hasn't anybody done this? Why hasn't anybody done that? And you get into complaining mentality because you're always thinking other people should be doing all these things. Whereas if you're responsible and a free person, you say, oh, that needs doing, I'll do it myself. Oh, I'm going to pick this up. Some, oh, I didn't drop it, so why should I pick it up? Yeah? Or I'll only pick it up if somebody tells me to pick it up. Yeah? But if you're responsible, then you say, oh, okay, it needs to be picked up, so I'll pick it up. It needs to be done, I'll do it. And you just do it and you don't think about it and you move on. So that's the difference between being responsible and being obedient. So while they're complaining all the time, they were complaining, they were expecting God or Moses to solve the problem. Yes? In that sense, they were still in a state of dependency. Why can't somebody else sort out the problem? Why can't so-and-so do it? Instead of thinking, oh, we haven't got much water, I'm going to go and see if I can find some. Why don't we get together and you know, dig a well? You know, there wasn't, people weren't taking the initiative, they're expecting Moses to do everything. Yes? So that complaining is a dependency kind of mentality, a servant or slave mentality. So because they were still like this, they weren't ready and qualified yet to go into Canaan. Now we have to think, you know, about us also as a spiritual community as well. You know, have we made this kind of transition yet? Anyway, so Moses then, he an extraordinary person really. One of the most remarkable leaders in human history. You know, what he went through, what he did, uh, despite everything. Anyway, when he's getting on a bit, he said to God, look, God, you know, I'm not going to lead the people into Canaan, but really they do need someone to do it. You know, can you find someone who can take over from me? And so then God recommended Joshua, and Moses then transferred his authority to Joshua. So Moses then gradually gave Joshua the authority to do the leadership, and he stepped aside. In that sense, you know, again, remarkable. He wasn't clinging on to power. He wasn't thinking, well, I'm the only one who can lead them. If, it, if I'm not here, I'm indispensable. You know, he had a very, you know, clear mind. Okay, then he was spying out Jericho. Two spies went to Jericho, and uh, they, you know, spied it out. And they came back, and, uh, you know, confident. And they set out for, Je for Canaan, for three days, they crossed over the Jordan, took 12 stones, built an altar, everybody was circumcised, celebrated the Passover, which reminded them going from slavery into freedom, from Egypt into Canaan, and then they met the army of the Lord. And they camped to Jericho. What's the time? Uh, oh, over time. Okay. And, and I just, this is, this, yeah, and they camped to Jericho, and then they defeated the kings, and that was that. 
And then we'll, next part we'll go on to after lunch.